Welcome everyone to the third ESG talk organized as part of the Candrium Academy. It is a part of our effort to provide continuous education on the ESG to the wider investment community. My name is David Chupriner. I'm head of ESG development at Candrium. This talk, like the previous ones, uh, will be available for replay on the Candrium Academy website after, uh, after today. Feel free to ask any question using the little chat box on the side. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, of course, uh, keeping in mind the large number uh, of participants. And what I will do like the last time is I will field questions to our panelists as we move along and when it, the question is, uh, is relevant for the, for the conversation. So let me first introduce you to our, uh, our three panelists. We have really a real great uh, lineup today with first Aurélie Ratt, who is the head of editorial governance at MSCI ESG Research. Welcome Aurélie. Matthias Zewald, who is Chief Investment Officer at Allianz France. And last but not least, Simon McMahon, who is Head of ESG Research at Systemalytics, part of Morningstar. So we are here today to talk about ESG research. Uh, ESG research is everywhere. Uh, rating providers have moved to the fringe of the investment community 10 years ago to becoming a central and essential provider of key data to the investment community. And they have moved beyond ratings to now encompass uh, other data on, for example, climate, working conditions, governance, controversies, or the involvement in specific controversial activities. On top of that, new regulation is likely to make uh, ESG research providers even more central as many investors, especially in Europe, we need them to comply with new disclosure obligations. Think about SFDR, uh, we talked about it the last time. Taxonomy, we also talked about it. as just two examples of such regulations. And with growing importance, should it come as a surprise that several EU countries have been calling on the EU Commission to regulate ESG research providers? We have an hour today, it's not very much, to try to shed some lights on these different questions and more with our three panelists. And uh, to get us started, I will turn first to Matthias. Um, and Matthias, just to set the stage here, could you please, please explain to us um, what are ESG ratings used for? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, David. Um, and if I may also, congratulations to you, to the Candram team for creating this format of uh, uh, bringing some education on the ESG topic. I think that's a very, very noteworthy and, and very worthy task to do uh, because I think the, uh, the topic will, will be with us, um, not just for a short term, but this is um, really something that will, will uh, uh, determine how we work together, how we invest going forward. Now, I, I represent here the investment management function of an asset owner. So um, as an asset owner, we work with asset managers to implement our strategic and tactical asset allocation. And uh, we do select our asset managers based on our own criteria. And among those criteria, we look at how asset managers build a coherent strategy around the use of, of ESG ratings in their individual asset uh, selection in the universe of, of listed investments. So um, our asset managers provide their own ESG analyses on listed issues. In this regard, we don't expect our asset managers to always have the same view um, as the ESG data providers, um, since we value their ability to build their own analysis. Um, in fact, they, they often wouldn't have the same view as an MSCI or Sustainalytics or any other ESG data provider. Um, so when do we, as an investment manager, use uh, um, ESG data providers' ratings? Um, we use them to build some components of our own strategy on responsible investments. And, and that strategy is built 
um, on three pillars. Uh, firstly, very simply, responsible investment. Second, ESG compliant investment. And thirdly, impact investing. For the first pillar, which is the broadest, um, it is based on exclusions where engagement is not possible and when the issuer's activity are incompatible with our convictions. Um, and here we, we do not use ESG ratings. Uh, the second pillar is, is ESG compliant investment, which is based on, on ESG assessment uh, of all our investments across asset classes and throughout their life cycle. And this is where we do use ESG ratings. Um, this assessment is, is notably based on, on external databases. We use external ESG rating in two aspects. I, uh, one is ESG data, data processing. Issues of listed asset classes are assessed along criteria that are offered by an external uh, data provider and ESG threshold setting that we use to identify companies with low ESG performance among groups of listed issuers. Um, and this assessment comes to life through our discussions with our asset managers, um, our voting policy and our engagement process. Um, then the last pillar, uh, impact investing, um, as this is mostly uh, concerning unlisted assets here, we do not use um, ESG ratings. In the end, what's the concrete use of, of ESG ratings in our interactions with our asset managers? Um, clearly what we do is we compare our asset managers assessment of listed issuers, ESG performance um, with the assessment provided by the external sources. Um, for instance, in the context of, of ESG threshold setting methodology, if a listed issuer in our investment universe scores below uh, the threshold, we have set based on external data scorings. We start a conversation with our uh, asset manager um, and it's important to exchange views since there is no perfect methodology. We then have three options, immediate divestment, which is clearly what we don't want because we want to have an impact. Uh, secondly, engagement, which is our preferred approach, again, based on this uh, evaluation. Um, um, and and uh, thirdly, which could also be a, 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 a result of this, an upward re revision. Um, that applies to cases where asset managers give sufficient proof to show that some issuer's specific uh, positive information is not fully or not accurately reflected in the ESG rating we get from, uh, from external sources, which we use in our, in our tool. So in conclusion, we use the ratings in our own uh, sustainable investment strategy for, for ESG compliant investment in, in listed asset. We confront this view with our asset managers uh, view. We discuss with our asset managers um, and hence ESG ratings offered by external providers uh, are an excellent basis to start building our own view. Thank you, Matthias. This is very interesting. You are here, you represent, uh, I would say a sophisticated approach to ESG investing and a a sophisticated way of using ESG research as you use several ESG research providers, you challenge your, uh, your investors, your, your asset managers based on your own ESG data. Uh, I'd like later on to come back to that point and how we, uh, an investor can use ESG uh, research if they don't, for example, have access to ESG research themselves to select a unit linked product. But first um, we need to, uh, shed some light on what is an ESG rating. Uh, I realized that ESG rating providers or research providers do not only provide ratings. Now, as I'm sure we'll, uh, we will discuss, the ESG research has moved beyond just ESG rating, but still they represent the core or the backbone of ESG research. So hence the importance of uh, understanding how you get from um, and now it has become a massive amount of, uh, of raw data to ESG ratings used by uh, investment, uh, investment managers to make investment decisions and value affect uh, valuation in equities or create risk uh, in the fixed income space. So I turn to um, first to, to you, Simon. Um, could you please uh, explain to us uh, what kind of raw data, uh, and I'm sure there is a lot, so uh, maybe you can help us to see a bit clearer here, do you use to, you know, to, to build uh, as the first building block to build the rating? Yeah, sure. Um, happy to. Yeah, thanks, David. And thanks to Candrium for hosting this, uh, this event. It's a great opportunity to talk a little bit more about, about ESG and ratings and to kind of uh, pr provide a little bit more information. So 
you know, well, data is, you know, as you indicated, the fundamental building block for much of what we do. You know, um, often when we think of our products, we sometimes think about, you know, the information hierarchy or the pyramid, right? So you have data at the bottom, then information, then knowledge, then wisdom. And as you go up the pyramid, there's more energy that is expended, but also more value or, or, or more insight that is created. And so from an ESG perspective, you know, ESG data is at the bottom. You know, those are the raw inputs and, and it's a big data world right now. You know, the, the amount and the size and the quality of the data is growing and, and, and improving. Um, after that, we have ESG assessments, um, which are places where analysts determine the meaning of the data, you know, typically by scoring the information according to guidance. You know, so for example, analysts will look at a carbon intensity number and based on industry benchmarks, determine if it's a number that demonstrates management strength or weakness, right? Um, one level up from that, we may then bring together those assessments to bring, you know, a higher level signals. So for example, maybe several carbon indicators properly combined together will provide a score or a rating for a company's overall management of carbon risk. And then at the highest level, we have the ratings, right? Which are complex models that aim to bring together you know, multiple factors to rate or measure something, uh, in our case, ESG risk. So, you know, what types of data are we talking about? Well, there's several types, you know, and I'll talk about uh, maybe the most widely used. Um, the first is exposure data. You know, exposure is where we determine the degree to which a company is exposed to specific ESG issues. Within our ESG risk rating, we look at 20 issues, such as you know, climate change, bribery and corruption, data privacy and security, et cetera. And so, for example, health and safety is an issue. Um, it's material for 62 sub-industries out of 138. And then Sorry within- here, Simon, I have to interrupt yep. you because you used a very important word and I would like us to get a chance to get back to that later, material. So um, yep. would you please uh, just briefly, because I'd like already to also give her, uh, her opinion on that, but define what you mean by material. So for us within our um, ESG risk rating, we're trying to determine the degree to which ESG factors will have a material impact on the financial health of a company, you know, through their, through their enterprise value. So, you know, a big part of what we do is try to determine which ESG issues have the potential to have a negative impact on a company and to what degree. And often the word that we use to speak about that concept and what we're trying to measure there is materiality. Thank you. Um, now I turn to you, Aurélie. Thank you, Simon. Um, so Simon has uh, explained that there are different sorts of, uh, of data that can be used and exposure is one of them. Um, Aurélie, could you please explain to us uh, how do you, um, you, you set a hierarchy between the data and you decide within all that data which one to, to use for a given company to get to its rating and which one to discard? Discard. Discard. Sure. Um, and thank you for again for for having me here today. Uh, so, you know, Simon mentioned the key word materiality. So it's true that our ESG ratings are industry relative and we measure the, the ability of companies to manage, well, not only the ESG risks, but also the opportunities. And uh, the fact that it's industry relative um, is important because the ESG issues that are financially relevant can be very different from one industry to the next. Um, so our ratings are driven only by the most relevant issues, uh, the key issues. So we have um, we, the 35 of them in our ratings model. So if you're looking at the software on an internet company, for instance, you're going to look at issues like human capital or um, privacy and data security. But uh, if you're looking at a mining company, for example, um, you're more going to look at things like uh, environmental impacts and uh, relations with local communities or issues like health and safety. Um, so we assess companies on two to seven environmental and social issues, depending on the industry. And uh, governance uh, is assessed for all companies, regardless of the industry, uh, because, you know, we strongly believe that um, corporate governance practices support the sustainability of a company and also uh, the balance of the economic and, in, um, and social interests of the different stakeholders. So that's how you choose which data to integrate is really by focusing on what's most material in a given industry. Okay, thank you, Aurélie. Now, let me ask you the obvious question and then I'll ask the same question to, uh, 
to Simon, what's your secret sauce to assess and determine what's material in a given industry? Is it like you have a, a team of uh, researchers, uh, some PhDs, do you use surveys? Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, artificial intelligence, because that's the key, right? I would say all of the above, <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> uh, you know, we were talking about data. I would say that alternative data uh, is crucial in our analysis because you know it minimizes the uh, the dependence on corporate disclosure. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, on average, so um, you know, in one of our ratings, about fifty percent of a of the information that goes into a rating comes from those alternative data sources. So if we're thinking of the healthcare sector, we use recalls data uh, it's, that's sourced from the global regulatory agency and we, we work that data, but that's independent from companies' disclosure. Um, so yeah, we, we base our information on our analysis assessment on uh, different data sources. So we have alternative data, government database, uh, some part of it is company specific. And that's, that determines as uh, similar to what, to what Simon says, exposure to a given risk. So where the most material key issues by industries are determined by the level of risks the industry faces. And you, Simon, uh, your secret sauce, uh, we are just uh, amongst us here, so feel free uh -huh. to speak openly. Well, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat similar to what Aurelie described. So we evaluate um, materiality or risk exposure at the sub-industry level. And so we look at about 140 different sub-industries and we set exposure issue by issue. And we try to make that as a process that's as much as possible um, driven by quant inputs. And so, you know, just as an example for human rights or business ethics, we'll look at the historical record of controversies, both by frequency and severity. That's a proprietary data set that we have. Um, in addition to that, we also spend a considerable amount of time doing what we call beta adjustments, which are company specific adjustments. Um, because you, you have the, I would say the industry exposure score, which is the starting point, but companies can vary quite significantly in terms of their exposure to given issues on the basis of, you know, the geography of where they're located. You know, if you're a mining company and you're operating in Northern Canada versus Africa, your exposure to um, human rights risk might be very, very different. So think, you know, we look at geography, we look at business model, we look at financial health, history of controversies. So we, I, we try to make it as data-driven uh, an approach as possible. That being said, you know, sometimes the data isn't, you know, as available as we would like it to be. And so there is some degree of analyst um, expertise that's also called upon. Uh, Matthias, anything you'd like to add to this? Do you also uh, do a maturity assessment uh, when you choose, uh, or do you review that to choose uh, ESG providers? Um, I, I was thinking of a different aspect when, when, when I heard the, uh, the exchange on, on materiality, because in the end, what we are looking for is uh, how, how, how is the potential impact of, of ESG issues at a, at, a, at a given issuer with regard to um, that investment turning into an asset without future, a stranded asset. Uh, so this is really what, what we are looking for then and um, where we expect um, for example, an, an, an ESG rating or a, uh, an assessment by, by an external provider um, to give us that point of view at any given point in time. However, um, and, and I was, it's probably what Aurélie was, was referring to uh, when, when, uh, when you were talking about uh, also the, the, the qualitative data part. Um, what I think um, is, is extremely important in order to then come to a what is more of a, of a holistic view on the issuer of the company that, that we are looking at um, is to understand what their, what their strategy is, because um, that, that's one of the achievements um, of the discussion that has been going on over, over years now already is that um, I don't think any issuer um, would, would claim today to simply stop and, and sit and relax at the status that they have reached. So this view about the strategy that uh, a company um, is, is in the process or wants to implement um, is, is a very important aspect that, that we are looking at. Um, and um, well, 
naturally any kind of uh, uh, rating um, will will need to find a way of also including this or simply then also have to state that um, the, the the view given um, is based on a on a on a certain point in time only um, but that's also where the the uh, internal assessment comes in because um, what um, we see in particular when we talk to uh, the the asset managers on on the listed side um, they do um, interview they do talk to the management they do uh, gather information in particular with regard to what what strategy um, the company is following and Admittedly, that's easy for, for listed issuers, but much more complicated for alternative assets, for sovereign bonds, uh, where data may be missing, where, where it's simply difficult to, uh, to get access. Um, and it also remains a challenge when it comes to kind of the new criteria, the new um, KPIs, so to say, that, that come into play when I, when I just think of, of biodiversity, when I think of um, more detailed view on, on how decarbonization is, is working, how uh, decarbonization of issuers helps us to decarbonize the portfolio. Um, and, and here as well, I think ESG ratings provide uh, a very important part, but only a part of the data. We need to build um, a, a comprehensive assessment of a company strategy in this regard. Thank you, Matthias. This is really fascinating. And this really brings us to the, uh, the next question, which is one that has been um, uh, raised by the audience. And this is an obvious one. We have here a representative from two uh, ESG research houses. And as many people will be aware, you do not always agree with each other. And as you've started to, uh, to highlight, you, you use different methodology. What I've heard so far from for, from both of you, Simon and Aurélie, is more what you have in common. I think what you do not necessarily have in common is the way you look at risks or risk versus opportunities and whether you look at companies in absolute terms or relative to sectors. I think these are maybe two areas where it would be interesting to hear you. But before I, uh, uh, before I just uh, turn the, the mic to you, uh, I just wanted to share with you uh, the result of a, a study done by the MIT School of Business uh, a year ago, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it. They studied the, the difference between the ratings from different ESG ratings providers on similar companies, and they saw there was quite a, a, a discrepancy or differences, which is not necessarily bad. It can be a good thing when you have different opinions of, on about the same companies. And they said, that essentially these differences could be explained by three things, which is a scope divergence, where uh, one agency includes uh, uh, specific factors, whereas the other doesn't. Secondly, weight divergence, where you apply different weights to the same factors. And thirdly, measurement divergence, where to measure something like the quality of working conditions, one will look at the turnover amongst the workforce, the other will look at the number of accidents. So same scope but different indicators and just these three differences which i'm sure you have can already explain uh, these differences but can i just ask you here um there's a few uh, few words about um how you approach this these subjects so that our audience can also better understand what differentiates you and why differences are actually healthy and uh, starting with uh, um, with you, Aurélie. Sure. Uh, so I would say, you know, uh, disclosures and big data are components of the model. But at the end of the day, it's very much how it's put together. And it's about how good the signal is at capturing what it aims to measure. Um, so, you know, we're talking different ratings dif between different providers, but if you're a user of those ESG ratings, what you should probably care about is whether the rating fits with what you want to measure. And I would say, you know, having more data is probably the easy part. <laughs> and the hard part is what to do with it and how to identify the, the and build the, the relevant signal. Uh, you know, as you pointed out in the intro, the signals that are extracted from this huge, massive amount of uh, ESG data serve many goals, so not just one, right? We have integration, exclusion, and impact. Um, to, to use a very simple analogy, I would say, you know, whatever rating you use, it's like, uh, you can think of it as like choosing a hotel. 
Uh, if you're looking to book a hotel, you can go to TripAdvisor and book whatever is number one right now. Uh, or, you know, you can use the ranking as your starting reference and then you filter for what it is you specifically are looking for, you know, the location, uh, whether it has a gym or a pool or, you know, what's included, what's not included. So, and, you know, I would say it's very, it's quite similar to how investors are using a our ESG ratings, so it's a reference points, and then clients add their own um, their own criteria, factors, etc., to differentiate their their investment strategy. A bit like Matthias mentioned before. Okay, thank you. Um, I will come back later to this analogy of the hotel to ask you <laughs> and Simon uh, what kind of hotel should I be looking for if I want to book with you or with Simon. But first, uh, uh, to you, Simon. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, this is an important discussion. It's one that comes up, you know, over and over again. And there's several reasons, I think, why ESG ratings may differ in their outcomes. You know, first, you know, not all ESG ratings are trying to measure the same thing, right? Um, you know, the study that you mentioned included kind of a range of, of ratings that are measuring, uh, you know, different things. You know, our rating and, e and MSCI's rating uh, aims to measure ESG risk. Others measure ESG impact or the impact of companies on society and the environment. Um, you know, it's also important to note that different ratings agencies have different capabilities and processes. You know, um, you know, our two companies have very large analyst teams, hundreds of people. Some ESG ratings have few or no analysts and are using AI or smart technologies. So it's not surprising to some degree that that would lead to different outcomes. But, you know, I, to your you know, point, there are also, even when we're trying to measure the same thing, you know, methodological choices that are made that can lead to different outcomes. You know, one important one is the difference between a best in class rating and an absolute rating, right? So we launched our ESG risk rating in uh, 2018 and we replaced our old rating, uh, which was not an easy feat to do. Um, and one of the decisions we made at that time was to focus on generating an absolute rating, um, an assessment, um, because we felt um, that we wanted something that would allow the comparisons, not just of companies to other companies in their sector, but all companies across a whole portfolio. Um, and that's not easy to achieve, right? And it's not typical of ESG ratings, but we felt this was really important because in the real world, ESG risk varies tremendously between industries. So an oil and gas company has many more material issues and more severe material issues than a software company or a services company. And we wanted our ratings to, to reflect that fact. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to reflect the fact that some industries are simply riskier than others. Um, the other point you raised, which can lead to, you know, a methodological change is, um, you know, we decided on our side to not mix ESG risk and opportunity into our rating. So our ESG risk rating uh, measures risk, um, and we have other products that look at opportunity. And we felt that was the right decision to be precise and disciplined in what we were measuring. Um, but, you know, there's no right answer necessarily. There's no standard for this at the moment. And I think MSCI has taken a different approach that could lead to different divergences. And I'll give you a stark, you know, a stark example. You know, we have Tesla rated as a high risk company in our ESG risk rating, right? And this is quite counterintuitive to some people because Tesla is producing electric cars, which are um, probably an important solution to the climate crisis. Um, but on the ESG risk side of things, we've identified a number of ESG issues which they um, you know, have high exposure to and inadequate ESG risk management around. And so even though you know, two ratings are measuring the same thing, there can be meaningful methodological divergences. And this highlights that the users of ESG ratings need to understand what is being rated. Thank you, Simon. This is extremely useful. And I'd like to dig a bit deeper on, on not on the example of Tesla, but let's take the automotive sector as, a, as an example. So you have companies making cars. Some are making more electric cars. Some are making more petrol and diesel cars. So they are, these are big employers. They have big workforce, workforces, many unionized people. Uh, these are companies with governance issues potentially as well. And these uh, companies making products with a massive impact on climate since transportation altogether presents about 20% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And for just cars, it's uh, I think about seven or 8%. Uh, so this is a, just examples of, uh, 
of potentially material ESG topics, the things we discussed earlier. So uh, how, how would you, uh, starting with you, Aurélie, how would you go about deciding when you analyze a, a car company, what is um, between uh, these different issues, the one that we play the biggest role, um, and then, then this, this decision leading to the, the ESG rating for that company. And then I ask you, Simon, as well, uh, to give us a, an idea of, and how often would you review, this is a question was raised by the audience, how often would you revise your opinion on what is material? Sure. Uh, okay. So that's that's a lot of uh, <laughs> of d different questions within one question. So how we choose the issues for for the um, for the um, for the auto sector, for instance. So again, you know, we use we measure ris risk exposure, the exposure of the industry to specific issues. So I uh, for the uh, you know I mentioned for for autos, governance is you know. For all industries, governance is always a key issue, for instance. So you're right. I mean, we're talking about labor management is definitely an issue within the um, within the um, the auto industry. The carbon footprint of, footprint of the cars obviously is an issue. Uh, the safety of the vehicles is an issue. And since we're looking at opportunities as well, we're also looking at what companies are doing in the clean tech, clean tech area, uh, clean tech areas. But then uh, it's specific for the companies. So Simon was mentioning Tesla, and obviously the risk profile for Tesla is not the same as it is for uh, Renault, for, <laughs> for for example. So you know we do measure risk exp exposure to to each of those risks by looking at where companies operate and uh, in which business segment. So we're really mapping. Like, I don't know, proportion of electric vehicles, proportion of diesel vehicle, proportion of, sorry, autos is not necessarily my sector, but proportion of um, uh, gas, gas vehicles, etc. you know, uh, trucks, etc. So we look at, we map out those um, business risk segment to get a, prop, a company specific risk profile, right? And then we look at the risk management indicators using the data we've been talking about. So company disclosure, but also alternative data sources. As to um, how often we uh, we look at, uh, we review companies, I would say, so we monitor them on an ongoing basis. So, and that's specifically with regards to controversies and governance events, because, you know, in terms of risk management, having policies and programs is all very great, but you need to assess the, uh, how effective uh, efficiently they're, they're implemented, right? So that's why you need performance indicators. So we're talking quantitative data, if we have, uh, if it's available, like health and safety metrics or uh, controversies. So we monitor this on, um, on an ongoing basis and uh, any significant um, trigger a trigger would, would lead to a re-rating. But what we do is uh, we review companies at least annually. Thank and, you. Yeah, and I can sorry. confirm, yeah, being on your website, I can see indeed that from one of the major car manufacturers you mentioned, it has been reviewed, uh, I think, uh, yeah, three weeks ago. So clearly there is a, an ongoing review. Um, if I go back to the analogy of the hotel, is it a fair, fair to say, Aurélie, and before I turn to Simon and then Matthias, that in your case, uh, uh, if someone would go to, to MSCI, because they want uh, an analysis that looks as much as opportunities, and you mentioned here opportunities in clean tech as at risk, and where the rating will reflect mostly how well the position, the, the company is positioned within its sector. So, for example, a, a car company that has a very, very good opportunity score on clean tech and reasonable risk, which is likely to be a triple A no matter how good or bad it is compared to an oil and gas or a, a tobacco company? So we, um, you know, we, since we look at both risks and opportunities, I would say uh, you can't, our ratings are industry relative, so you can't really compare a AAA in the auto industry and a AAA in mining, but that's also why we have two types of scores. We have an absolute score out of 10 and we have an industry relative score. So the rating AAA is uh, based, is an industry relative one. But, you know, as a client, if you want to use the absolute score, you can. And in which case, you know, take your AAA company in autos and AAA company in mining. And for, okay, for the sake of argument, let's just say the 
auto company scores uh, six out of 10 and the mining company scores five out of 10, you know, they're both AAA. They're the best in their respective mm -hmm. sectors. But you can argue that the auto company manages the ESG risks and opportunities it faces better than the mining company. To you, Simon, and then Matthias for a reaction. Um, well, maybe just to speak a little bit about our process. So we, you know, similar to Orderly, we have kind of annual updates to the companies, um, but we also have an annual process for evolving the parameters within our framework. And so this is the time when we provide our analysts with the opportunity to adjust their perspectives on which ESG issues are material and by how much for every industry. Um, and so this is also their opportunity to propose new indicators or changes to indicators. And so that's a fairly intense process. And it's, it's one of the processes where our, our most senior analysts and their expertise really comes into play. Um, you know, when it comes to, to automotives, I think we have a relatively similar set of, uh, you know, list of material issues, um, you know, product governance, corporate governance, labor, you know, um, climate change, human capital. Um, you know, but similar to Orly, we have um, also modifications. And so what we would say for climate change is we look at the fleet efficiency of the automotive company, right? And that would be a way that we adjust the climate change risk. And so for Tesla, actually, you know, we have basically multiplied their exposure score for carbon coming from their products and services by zero, right? So that they basically their exposure to that issue has, has gone from a very a relatively high number for most automotive companies down to to, to really a, a non-issue. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, and then in terms of how we bring it all together, you know, we, we look at exposure on the one hand, it's a two-dimensional rating, and then we issue by issue determine how much risk that company should be managing. And then we look at, you know, the, the management side of things, to what degree is the company managing that risk and what what is left is a is a gap right it's a it's a gap that we refer to as unmanaged risk and then if you add up all of the unmanaged risk coming from all the issues that the company is exposed to you finally get to um, the the ESG rating so if I'm a hotel customer I will come to you Simon to uh, um, just analytics if I see mostly ESG as a way to identify risk and especially I want to have a a very clear view about the unmanaged part of the risk any company is exposed to, and this is measured across sectors in an absolute way. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. I mean, of course, you can always, if you if you take this this absolute approach, you can also look at the scores within a given sector and identify who the leaders are within a given sector. But fundamentally, when you look at our top level rating, the signal that we're providing is an absolute rating looking at looking at ESG risk. Matthias, what do you make of all that as a, as a user of uh, ESG research yourself? Any if, surprise? If may, if, no, no, no. <laughs> if, um, if I may come back to your, to your hotel example uh, with which you started the discussion. Um, and and um, I think, first of all, it's good that we don't all have the same taste with regard to hotels, um, which creates a variety. Um, and I think in general, what is, however, needed is the transparency that platforms, as you have mentioned, provide us with. So transparency in terms of understanding what are the different methodologies, what are the different uh, bases used with which um, different providers come to, your, um, come to their, their assessment. If, if I take the hotel example one step further, that is, there may be people who like um, wherever they go in the world uh, to find the same style hotel room um, and others who like, who have uh, maybe uh, the preference to say in each country, I want the specific style to be, to be represented. Now, personally, I would fall into the second category, but from the uh, position of, of uh, representing um, the local part of a global organization, I have to say what we need also is consistency, coherence, um, in, and a global approach of those who do the assessment, because we can't have a situation where I in France uh, use a different model than the colleagues in Italy or the colleagues based in, in Singapore do. So um, what, what is very important, in addition to the, to the transparency aspect, I think really is also the capacity um, to, to have a global approach and, and to have a consistent model applied um, wherever um, companies are, are assessed or, or, or rated. Um, in the end, I think um, it, it's, it's, a, it's unfortunately 
with regard to its consequences sometimes a topic that we all struggle with when when we when you talk about esg about investing um in in uh, in compliance with with esg expectations and rules there is no perfect methodology. Um, we all simply have to find what, what is best um, for our purpose, um, based on the transparency, make, um, make our own uh, assessment. Um, but clearly, uh, the fact that there is no perfect methodology, and, and here I come to more the, uh, uh, the opinion part, uh, should not um, make us refrain from gearing and steering our portfolios towards a, a, a better approach. Um, and the and, uh, direction should, should certainly not be to, to sit and wait uh, for, for methodology evolve and, and to reach a point where um, everyone is happy to read, have reached the, uh, the optimal. This will never be the case. And, and I think um, time is running out in terms of uh, what we need to do. Um, what, what is an additional aspect? I think all that I've mentioned creates uh, an asymmetry between clearly institutional investors and, and individual investors. So there, there is a certain need to work on harmonizing uh, uh, data assessments to ensure comparability. I mean, we do that already with, with our approach to say we want to have uh, a globally the same uh, methodology applied, but also a higher degree of, of readability for our clients. Um, and in that respect, our favor would always be to, to say, um, we need to collaborate more. Uh, we need to collaborate more, for example, on a global level, as is the case today um, with the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance that has agreed on a certain methodology, on a certain approach uh, uh, to define and to implement carbon reduction targets, um, or on a local level, if I mentioned in, in France, the Finance for Tomorrow initiative that, that uh, is also working in that sense. Um, or discussions also on the European level. So um, this kind of Absolutely. harmonization, I think, is important. Yeah, yeah, you, you make a very good point. And I'd like us to conclude this talk later, uh, just reflecting about what will come uh, ahead uh, in terms of uh, development in harmonization uh, pertaining to ESG data. Before we get to that point, um, I'd like us to talk about uh, ESG fund rating. But before that, there was a question from the audience about... Um, the S in ESG, and it's a broad question. So feel free to, uh, you know, to answer uh, any part you feel more comfortable with, but in the S space, how much of the data you use is self-reported and how much is based on, uh, on models? And uh, maybe starting with you, Simon. Uh, sure, yeah, so we, I mean, typically we don't favor E versus S in any way. It's a it's a it's a materiality um, analysis. So it really depends on the industry which issues are are more or less material. You know, when we think about S, we're thinking about things like business ethics, bribery and corruption, um, community relations. You know, um, human capital, human rights, um, human rights in the supply chain, things like that. Um, I do think in the in the global conversation, the S issues sometimes tend to get understated or, or, or are underrepresented in part because climate change is just such an, a pervasive um, issue and it's an existential threat. So it, it deserves that attention. Um, you know, I think the COVID crisis has actually had an impact of bringing some of the issue, issues more to the forefront in the public imag imagination. So things like um, health and safety, or even data privacy and security, you know, when we look at, at the things like, like Zoom, um, you know, or issues within the supply chain, you know. So uh, as we've always taken S issues very, you know, just as seriously as E issues, but I think sometimes, you know, in the, in the public sphere, they, they get a little bit less attention. In terms of estimations, um, you, know, we, you know, we do use a limited amount of estimation models for quant data. Uh, we use estimations for uh, carbon and water data, so scope one, scope two, scope three, intensity and absolute emissions and water withdrawals, water consumption data. Um, we don't use estimations at all for, um, for anything related to, to social issues. So just to pick up on that, in the S, you will look at working conditions. For a mining company, you might want to consider the number of accidents. Uh, what would you do if uh, a given company doesn't self-report on the number of accidents in the previous year? Would you then disregard the data and give it a, a negative score or give it the industry average? Uh, well, we, we 
have a number of different means, not just company disclosures. There's certain things that companies are quite good at disclosing and other things that they're not particularly proactive in disclosing and controversies or fines or incidents are certainly something that, that we don't rely on the companies to self-disclose. And so we look at to media sources and we look to governmental databases to try to collect that information. Uh, we then have a process also of taking the information we've collected and reaching out to the companies to ask them to confirm the information that we've collected or to add to it. Uh, and then, you know, that would be the basis and the information inputs that we use to come to those types of determinations. Thank you, Simon. And now I turn to you, Aurélie. Same question about the S, but more generally, as already Simon alluded to, what do you do uh, when you do not have uh, self-reported data, which often is the case in some, some areas? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's it's relatively similar to what Simon said. You know, our, I think our methodology has been designed to 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 accommodate for large variations in disclosures. So even including almost no ESG disclosures for companies that are smaller in market cap, for instance, or in uh, uh, regions that are relatively new to ESG issues. So we, similar to, to what Simon said, we don't penalize companies for lack of disclosure. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, half of the analysis is also analyzing risk exposure, and that comes from standard financial disclosure. So typically there's no uh, change to our model that's uh, necessary to, to, to accommodate for companies with lower disclosure. But again, you know, I would say, we, that being said, uh, you know, we've seen regulatory developments in the last few years, so we can all agree there's definitely been an increase in the availability of environmental data. Uh, social data is most challenging, and we've seen that indeed with the COVID crisis and the Black Lives Matter movement in the US. And for instance, if we're talking workforce diversity, um, and um, work for racial diversity as well. You know, we run an exercise and looked at US companies. And about two years ago, we looked at what US companies were doing and found that most pretty much disclosed nothing at all. And there's some movement because last, uh, so last fall of 2020, we found that we had 34 companies. So including the big ones like Verizon, Target, uh, or even Chevron that made a commitment to disclose that data. Uh, and you know, it's moving the needle slightly, uh, but we're talking long-term. And in this context, I would say, you know, like I said earlier, uh, the alternative data sources and the artificial intelligence solutions are going to be instrumental in filling the gaps for the social data. Thank you. This is fascinating. Using all the data we have discussed so far, more and more now, uh, fund ratings have been created. So uh, um, MSCI created uh, an ESG fund rating using MSCI um, ESG data. Morningstar, which, as I mentioned, owns uh, Sustainalytics, created uh, a sort of ESG fund rating uh, using Sustainalytics data. Uh, and more and more investors are relying on that. So I will first uh, ask Matthias, as investor, do you use uh, ESG fund ratings in your selection and uh, what do you make of them? Let me, let me start from, from the two perspectives, one being um, the institution investors that invest for the proprietary portfolio. Um, here, the key for us is in the discussion with the, uh, with the asset managers, we tell them what we expect um, and we want them to implement what we have defined as our ESG framework, um, the, the governments they need to implement and so on. So that, that's really not where um, we would be looking necessarily for a rating. It can be a door opener for an asset manager when, when they come to see us to show, um, yes, we do have this rating, this label or whatever. Um, but, but in the end, it will always be then a, a dialogue with the asset manager and, and understanding how credible um, and, and consistent their, their approach is. Um, a different um, topic in that sense is when we are looking at um, funds that we include in our unit linked life insurance offering. Um, and uh, there, there clearly is a point in some customers, some, some sales channels require labels, ratings, um, whatsoever. Um, uh, in the end, what we have decided to do is um, uh, 
include in our range of, of unit link products, funds that do have ratings, that do have labels, but to also uh, do an overlay of our own uh, assessment that, that we can provide. Um, and, and clearly that doesn't exist for the whole uh, uh, range of funds we have included yet, but it is um, something that we are in the process of building up doing an overlay in terms of what is our own assessment, first of all, of the asset manager quality and of the fund quality. So we also are in a position to, to tell clients of certain unit linked insurance products that this satisfies this requirement. Another product goes more in a different direction, has a different kind of quality. Um, th this gives, um, in a sense, also comfort to um, the different sales channels that we use to make sure that uh, th they can also use this um, as a basis um, in the customer discussions. Um, first of all, finding out what the customer really wants, what, they, uh, what their interest is, um, and then uh, respond with the, uh, with the appropriate offer. But in, in the end, it all comes down to, um, I think, um, an understanding uh, based on the given transparency, what a rating or a label really tells us. Because if, if I just take the, the lessons learned from the 2007, 2008 financial crisis, we all thought that a triple A was a triple A as it used to be uh, 10 years before, and we learned it wasn't. So um, we need to understand what's behind it. Uh, this is a, yeah, and a very good point you're making, Matthias. Um, the triple A is not, not necessarily a triple A for everyone. Uh, a triple A for uh, uh, MSCI, at the fund level might not translate into a triple A or similar rating at uh, uh, Morningstar using statistics data level. So I, I would ask you uh, first, Aurélie, if you could briefly just, I know it's not your, uh, your primary area, but uh, since we have you here today, um, how do you think investors should uh, use uh, ESG fund rating? Or do you think should they use uh, ESG fund rating at this stage knowing all the uh, uncertainty about the underlying data we, we discussed? Um, well, I would say, you know, fund ratings would give investors information about the ESG characteristics of funds and also give provide additional information that can be used as part of the ESG fund research selection, etc. I think, you know, um, having access to the ESG characteristics of funds or portfolios uh, based on consistent metrics is a good thing because it can reduce risks of greenwashing, but also facilitate comparability. Uh, but we, we go back to, you know, talking about the methodology, we go back to the points we mentioned previously, you know, our ESG ratings methodology does, is the foundation of our fund ratings offering. And I think it's crucial for investors and users of these fund ratings to be clear about, you know, these objectives and also to have a thorough understanding of the methodology behind these fund ratings and how it fits with their investment strategy. Uh, so I would say knowing what's behind the rating is part of the uh, due diligence process. Okay, Simon, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, sure. I mean, you know, maybe the first thing to say is that while, you know, I can't and wouldn't want to speak for all ESG ratings, I know that, you know, we've invested, a, you know, a tremendous amount of energy into our ESG ratings and the strength and size of our team. We're adding 100 people to our team this year to support our ESG research. Um, and so I think if you, and, and I think, you know, we believe in our ratings and I'm sure Arlie believes in, in her ratings as well. You know, there are not all ESG ratings are, are, are built the same, but I also do think that generally the ESG landscape is still somewhat immature, right? ESG ratings have been around for a long time, but it's it really feels like to use a baseball analogy, you know, we're in the second or third inning of a nine inning game when it comes to, to ESG um, and the stakes are, are, are going up, you know, and so, you know, ESG ratings will mature over time. Data will get better. Definitions will become more consistent. We also believe, you know, at Sustainalytics that ESG rating agencies are going to be regulated at some point soon, which is, you know, something that we generally welcome. Um, and, you know, so I think that, I think that, you know, I think it's important for people to, to understand that. But also to Aurelie's point, you know, it's really important also that ESG users, the number of which is really exploded, many of whom are newer to ESG, th th those users also need to, um, you know, for lack of a better word, mature in terms of understanding how to interpret and use ESG ratings. Thanks. And um, this is a rhetorical question to you both, but I wonder whether you're, sometimes you're not worried of 
being a bit caught uh, into the uh, overwhelming enthusiasm and simple need uh, from more and more investors for uh, ESG data and ESG research because of all the new regulations coming and sometimes users and clients uh, that are very new to the field and might not appreciate all the complexity that we're trying to uh, a bit highlight today in this discussion, not because complexity is bad, but because it, ESG is uh, this E, S, and G first, and as you both highlighted, and Matthias also um, shed some light on, uh, these are uh, be, under these three uh, words, many different uh, realities being measured. Many of them are very qualitative, are not as simple to, as a, a, a amortizing figure or a revenue figure. I see we have a very interesting question here from the audience uh, that, that is specifically addressed to, to Matthias. And we have only a few minutes left. So Matthias, if you could be brief so we can also discuss uh, with the time left uh, uh, what's coming then uh, in terms of uh, uh, ESG research in the next few years. But the question, I, and I reread it, um, have you thought about how to integrate ESG criteria in the attribution of performance of your portfolios and what do you believe pose the biggest challenge for such an exercise? Very good question. Um, and I can answer with, with one simple example linked to the fact that among all of the ESG topics, it's uh, decarbonization, it's uh, effect on climate change that has the greatest visibility at the moment. I'm, I'm not gonna say it's the most important. We, we may or may not agree on it, but it clearly is the most visible. So what we have done last year is um, for the French portfolio, um, we have built over the time um, what we call a financial frame underlying investment decisions. This financial frame is simply there to ensure that whenever we take uh, investment decisions with regard to asset classes or um, uh, larger positions, that we do not uh, consider just whatever economic performance and forget about solvency or discuss um, uh, encountering impact and, and forget economic performance. Uh, so it's a whole list of KPIs and we've added last year a KPI uh, on how does this investment contribute to the decarbonization promise and engagement that we have taken as part of the Asset Owner Alliance. Um, I think this is a key part of how to integrate this into very concrete decision framework and to make it work. Um, was that easy? I would say fairly because the conviction is there to uh, make sure that we move in the right direction. Um, at the same time, um, not so easy because what KPI to, to, to build on in the end. And um, it took us a while to really say, let's forget about all the complexity. Um, it's time to act. It's time to move forward. Let's focus on the most important and therefore decarbonization. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthias. And for uh, uh, people watching this, uh, the next talk will be about decarbonization and mm -hmm. climate impact. So uh, stay tuned. Um, now we have only a few minutes left and I wanted to uh, ask the three of you, uh, starting uh, with you, already a very simple question is how do you see ESG data in five years? What's going sure. to happen and uh, how will it influence uh, ESG ratings? It's a huge question. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, we, we haven't had time to, to, to delve into it today. And, you know, I think we're all aware that there is... Uh, lot of regulations coming up, you know, globally and under discussion. So you definitely, you know, initiatives that encourage companies to make better, more meaningful ESG disclosures are better, uh, are strong, is, are good, you know. Uh, but I think disclosure challenge will grow for companies and investors, uh, even though there has been some progress in the past. So, you know, when I entered the ESG business <laughs> 10 years ago now, uh, it was really challenging to get any response from companies. And that's completely changed uh, and many issuers have improved on their reporting practices so I would say you know the um, uh, corporate world is not un under prepared for the uh, upcoming uh, regula re regulatory pressure that's going to keep going. Uh, we also have a lot of investors with, with great disclosure practices but 
we also have lots of new players in the game. Uh, so I think the upcoming data requirements also pose challenges for those new uh, those new joiners. But, um, and I'll leave the, the floor to, to, to my fellow speakers, but, uh, you know, we, if we look at the bright side of things, we see opportunities in this wave of, um, of new ESG data demands. Uh, there will likely be technological solutions, uh, including ones we're, we're working on, uh, to, to, to help better and harmonize and distribute ESG information and insights. How about you, Simon? Anything to add to this? Well, yeah, covered quite a lot there, didn't she? Um, <laughs> she was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think. I mean, I think generally speaking, it, it's an incredibly dynamic space that we're operating in right now. You know, across many, many different dimensions, and I think that the tailwinds behind ESG remain quite strong. You know, I think there's there's ways in which I think ESG has gotten a little bit too far out in front of its skis. You know, when we look at, um, you know, the way people are perceiving performance, um, but still, at least for the next few years, ESG is going to continue to grow rapidly. There's numerous tailwinds. We're going to be seeing that in investors are increasingly accepting that ESG has the potential to create better investment decisions. We're seeing greatest adoption, greater adoption across asset classes, across different investor types. We're seeing we're going to see more disclosures, uh, making ESG more effective. Um, we're seeing regulations in many parts of the world that are supportive of ESG. Um, and perhaps lastly, you know, many ESG issues are simply becoming more urgent. And so ESG, it's not going anywhere. Um, and I think over time, the data will improve, which will also be um, very welcome. Matthias, the final words to you. Just three very quick points. I think uh, due to regulatory pressure and to uh, uh, investor needs, transparency will increase. Secondly, uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges will be to ensure fair access to this data so that we can all benefit, including also individual investors. And thirdly, but most importantly, I think we shouldn't wait five more years to build the best publicly available ESG database. We need to act now to answer the challenge of the time and um, climate change, I would name as the first one here. You're right. And I think there is a, a plan at the commission level, uh, EU commission level, to create such a, a public repository of, uh, of uh, ESG data. Um, well, I think our time is up. I would like to uh, thank you all three, Aurélie, Matthias, Simon, really for the quality and, of this discussion and for sharing your insight with our audience. I hope this was uh, insightful for, um, for uh, uh, our spectators and uh, we look forward to uh, sharing with you uh, some more great contents about ESG uh, during our next ESG talk, which will be about uh, climate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.